having an honest conversation with some, with somebody a stranger or someone you know is really rare like having a personal conversation one that makes somebody cry or happy or angry having that one on one with somebody very rare capturing it on camera is even more unlikely and when you do it that's like lightning in a bottle If you look at the most viral videos, not only on TikTok, but online, they're framed like that. <laughs> like my most viral video, the whole thing is like this. Right. Because I didn't, I wasn't thinking about like, oh, uh, you know, is this gonna look it? I was just like, this guy is inviting me to his house. Like, let me just place the camera so I can capture it. And it's, it's it literally looks like that the whole time. But yeah. Just, people he, feel that frequency. If you want, you. if you want to follow me back to my house, okay, you can come into my house and we'll sit down and talk. Today I sat down with the creator of Are You Happy? If you're not familiar with the page, this is a account on TikTok that is growing crazy fast. Last time I checked, he was at 600,000. When I checked again today, it's almost at 900,000. Makes these very viral and very interesting videos asking the simple question, Are you happy? Uh, the question is, Are you happy? Not right now. Why? Not right now. What? I just ran away from my home. Really? <laughs> why did you why did you run away? Because I was not happy. Do your parents know where you are? Yeah, I just told them. Oh really? What did you say? I showed them the sandals. And I told them, now I'm happy. Now he's asking this to, you know, complete strangers in very different, you know, aspects in life. He's interviewing people from Utah, people from India, people that are old, people who are young. It's asking the same question to a variety of different people and hearing a variety of different answers. All right, I hope you guys do enjoy this video. And if you do, don't even worry about liking and subscribing today. I want you to go give a follow to the Are You Happy account on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. Wherever you guys are the most, go ahead and go follow there because it means a lot to me that Atta is sat down and talk to me and just kind of, you know, got this interview out here for you guys to watch because I think it's been really cool to get more insight from a more successful filmmaker than myself and somebody who's doing something really impactful. So I think I gained a lot from just sitting down and talking with them and I think some of the answers and things you'll hear in this video will help you too as a filmmaker. So uh, my name is Adve. I am a filmmaker. I've been making films ever since I was a kid. Um, and it's what I've been doing for my career. So I, I like basically to pay the bills, I direct like advertising, advertising spots, commercials. I've done stuff for like KFC and Tide and some other companies. Um, and all of that, and I, you know, I used to work for a studio. Um, out in LA and all of that income that I got is basically rent, food, and my own films. And those films, um, like I, I've hit the festival circuit with a bunch of my films, you know, not so great in terms of rewards or reception, but of course, you know, with anything, the more you do it, the better you get. So I just kept practicing and getting better and better and investing more and more and more to the point that like my own films became enough that I could um, kind of leave the nine to five and start focusing more on my own projects. And um, as a lover of film, I'm always watching new stuff and old stuff. And I was watching this documentary called Chronicle of the Summer. Mm -hmm. And it's a French documentary. The reason I watched it is because one of my favorite film genres, um, which is cinema verite or like, uh, you know, which translates to real film in, uh, in, in French. That term came from this film, Chronicle of the Summer. So of course I'm like, oh, I gotta check this film out. Um, and basically it's a documentary where two non-filmmakers go into the streets of Paris with like the cheapest camera they could find at the time, which was a 60 millimeter camera. 
uh, and like this cheap microphone and they go out into Paris and they ask everyone that passes by if they're happy. Are you happy? Are you happy? Uh, which is what it was in French. And um, the film is really cool because it ends up feeling less like a documentary, but more like a narrative film. Because um, what happens while the film is happening is like they'll run into a police officer on the street. They'll ask him if he's happy. And then all of a sudden they're in this guy's living room and we're meeting his family. And then we're, you know, we look at what his wife is doing. And then all of a sudden we're at his wife's workplace and then we meet his wife's boss. And then we find out the wife's boss life story. So it basically becomes this narrative film, um, which is how the term cinema verite came from this documentary. So I'm making my own movies, um, making my own ads, starting to be hired as a director and I see this film and I'm like, oh, I wanna do this, but I wanna go around the world with it. So I thought I'll, I'll start in the United States and then see where it goes after that. I hit the entire United States, went from the West Coast to the East Coast. And then um, after I was done with that, went to India, went to a few places there. And I'm still on that mission. I'm still on the mission to find the happiest person in the world. What I've kind of been wondering is like, you know, it's blown up so much on TikTok. So like, what's that been like? Dude, I, I take it we're around the same age. I feel like we kind of grew up with YouTube. Like YouTube, like around 2007, 2008 was where creators went to kind of make it. Um, and although YouTube still kind of holds that status, TikTok was just an emerging platform that I saw my little brother on. And I was like, oh, let me, you know, let me just give it a try. Um, and something I had intended to make a full documentary out of, I was kind of lazy to start a full edit without like a following at all. Um, so I was like, oh, well, why don't I just take the easy route and try to create some, some sort of following from just like uh, the short interviews that I did with people, just pull clips. I was like, It'll, it's so easy to serialize this, ser this feature film that I want to make. Uh, let me just upload it on this you know, emerging platform for creators. And I didn't know anything about how people could just blow up overnight on TikTok. I didn't know anything about the community. And then all of a sudden, I just see all these people start starting to watch. And it was, to be honest, it was really gratifying because as I'm sure you know, this, like being a filmmaker is hard, dude. It's, yeah. it's so hard to make it, but it's, it, before you even make it, it's hard to make the movie. <laughs> it's like, if you actually know, like if you've made a film before on any scale, you know that it's like hard to get a crew, hard to um, get, get a good story, Hard to execute that story well visually and then once it's all executed well visually it's hard to edit it in a compelling way once you edit it in a compelling way it's hard to market it distribute it in a in a in a actually productive way it's just hard all around so to see something after so much failure after so many bad movies and projects that i made to see something finally hit and connect it was awesome. It was incredible. Yeah. I try to like, you know, let younger filmmakers or other people kind of like trying to get into this, like give them some advice. Uh, what would your kind of like advice be right now for somebody getting started? Like, would you recommend they try to do something like the route with TikTok that you did or, you know, what sort of tips would you give them? That's a great question. That's a great question because there's no, I, like what you're doing right now, Although it sounds like it's like obvious, like, oh yeah, make a channel that gives advice to like filmmakers. I feel like I didn't, I didn't see that. You know, I was just looking at interviews of like my favorite filmmakers and that's how I got my advice. But I would say um, get, uh, get a job, hopefully in that industry. There's so much opportunity because everyone's got a screen in their pocket. So everyone's making content, find a job that uh, is around making visual content. The closer to what you want, the better, but don't, you know, don't ask for too much. And then 
use that money to fund your own projects. And if you didn't go to film school, it's fine. You basically, you will have to go through that obstacle course of learning how to make films somehow. So just, you know, whether it's with your, uh, whether it's with your iPhone, or whether it's with your DSLR or whatever in between, make stories, make like one a day. And then at the end of the year, you'll have 365 and maybe uh, 364 will be crap, but two of them will be good. And if two of them aren't good, then do it again the next year and eventually you'll have something good. And then once you have, like, once you've figured it out, once you've got like the toolkit, you kind of know it technically, start making spec content. That's how I kind of started making money from it. So a spec ad is like, um, if you were hired to make an ad for Apple, um, what would you do? And then just make that start to finish and then make an Apple ad. And once you've got your spec ads, your, your films, uh, you know, you made, say you made 600 little short stuff with your iPhone or Canon, take like 10 of the best ones, take your spec ads, make your free website. That's your portfolio and then just reach out to every single agency production company around the world or wherever you want to work. I wanted to work in Europe. So I found an awesome agency in Kosovo and they were more than happy to work with an American filmmaker, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I did it. I just went out there and I, I directed for them. So um, yeah, I, I, that that's the advice that that's what I did. That's what worked for me. I made a lot of mistakes. So I won't mention those, but if anyone could give me like some really streamlined advice when I was 20 or like 18, like, what do I have to do right now? It's like, boom, just do these things. If you're starting out, don't, or you could, but like, you'll have less of a chance getting on a roster of an agency or production company in Hollywood than you would in like Lithuania. Right. You know, why not? Why not go to Prague? You know, the filmmaking community in Prague is insane. So get an agency. They will definitely respond to an email or call from an American filmmaker with American background just because you have this unique experience. Whatever is closest. Uh, I like to keep my DSLR on me at all times, um, but it's just kind of bulky and not very convenient for like travel. Right. So um, I'll, I'll typically do like an iPhone with a lens, boom. Um, and if not, my hand, like most of what you see was shot on like a Canon power shot which is like a point and shoot um, right. Canon camera, which, hey, like at this point, it's, it's being uploaded to people's iPhones. So um, yeah. quality, quality of story, very important. Quality of res video resolution, not as important. Yeah, definitely. Like, I feel like too many filmmakers especially get caught up on the visuals having to look perfect, but the storytelling has definitely been way, way more important. I've, I've even realized that more recently, because for the longest time I would delay a video by like a week just trying to reshoot stuff, but it's like, there's no point, you know? And it's not only like, I mean, I'm guilty of that, like placing visuals over uh, storytelling, and I'm still, you know, I'm still learning, I'm still getting better at that. Um, and it's not, like when you say storytelling, it's basically what that means for me is truth. And without it sounding too wazzly woozly, um, the really, like the best films you've seen, the biggest films, um, or the, the most viral videos or the most compelling videos, they all are honest in their own way. And in my experience, the, the stuff that I've made that really hit was stuff that I was like, was manipulating it as little as possible uh, and just putting the truth out as, as much as, as much as I could. So like having an honest conversation with, some, with somebody, a stranger or someone you know, is really rare. Like um, 
having a personal conversation, one that makes somebody cry or happy or angry, having that one-on-one -on -one with somebody, very rare. Capturing it on camera is even more unlikely. And when you do it, that's like lightning in a bottle. And that, that's usually what connects with people because what I've learned is that truth is a frequency. Truth is, truth is like its own frequency, but, and this is what TikTok has taught me, you, only truth tellers could hear it. So like, you know, your people, if you know, people listening or watching this are like, dude, what are you talking about? Um, I'll, I'll explain it in the best way I can. While I'm editing, I'll be like, oh, like she didn't say this here, but it, it would be perfect if I kind of, if I kind of, you know, make it, arrange it to put it, to make it in a more compelling way. That's okay. That's like bending the truth a little bit, storytelling. Yeah. And then there's like moments where you go like, you know, and then that kind of throws the frequency off. And then me as like the liar, I'm like, nah, that, that'll work. That'll, that'll be okay. But the people that are watching, they know the frequency is off. Whether or not they know it consciously or subconsciously, a viewer, like the audience can tell if you're bullshitting them. And they can also tell if you're being open and honest. So like making movies, like making visual content is all about that truth bar. And like the more you bend it, the less likely people are to connect. The more, like, if you just keep it like that, it might not be as compelling. Sometimes you go like, boop, you kind of man manipulate it in such a way that it's like truthful, but like really good storytelling. You know, I love the fact that you're teaching that, like, you know, the importance of storytelling over visuals. If you look at the most viral videos, not only on TikTok, but online, they're framed like that. Yeah. <laughs> like my most viral video, the whole thing is like this. Right. Because I didn't, I wasn't thinking about like, oh, uh, you know, is this going to look it? I was just like, this guy is inviting me to his house. Like, let me just place the camera so I can capture it. And it's, it's it literally looks like that the whole time. But yeah. Just, people he feel that frequency. When I originally found her, I didn't think much of the interview. Um, and then when I uploaded it, a lot of people, I just uploaded the raw interview at first and then people like freaked out. They were like, who is this girl? Who's this guy? Uh, and then I kind of backtracked. I was like, wait a second, let me look at the raw footage. What did I miss? Um, and let me try to get back in touch with her. And, uh, of course, like an idiot, I didn't get her contact information. I only got the guys. So I was like, oh, man. And then I reach out to him, and he sends me this really cryptic email that's like, oh, we're actually in different places right now. Uh, she's not available at the moment, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, what? And he won't give me your contact information. I'm like, can I talk to her? He's like, sorry, I, it's, not, it's not up to me. I, I can't give out her personal information. So I'm left to try to find this girl. After some investigating, I find this picture that she's tagged, uh, that, that she's in, but she's not tagged in. So of course I freak out that I find her. I'm like, yes, first of all, I'm like, am, I, is it, am I sure that it's her? And then I do, from that picture, I go on that person's account and end up finding her and her profile. I'm like, all right, that's it, that's her. Um, but she hadn't posted in a while. So all of these comments are in my head. People are like, um, she's, getting, she's being kidnapped. She's part of human trafficking. Um, that, guy is, that guy is sus, blah, blah, All these people are getting in my head. And that guy's being um, elusive. He's not responding to messages. He's not giving me your contact information. Come to find out he's just respecting your privacy. But when I finally got that email, I like woke up to a message from her. I was... I was elated, not like, not, not for myself, but so people could finally get off my back of like, <laughs> um, you know, you, you caught a girl that got kidnapped and you won't, you won't give us any updates. So finally yeah. found her, felt great. You know, there are so many similarities in people's answers, like people that are happiest, if I were to like graph them, 
it would be like the happiest people in the world care about three things. It's family. You know, like if you put, were to put on a bar graph, like level of happiness and like uh, uh, themes, topics, uh, the happiest people, family way up. And family doesn't necessarily mean like mother, brother, sister, uncle. It could be like colleagues, friends, girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, boss, basically like your, your people that you're around. Those like a huge similarity in the happiest people that I've met is joy. I mean, it's, it's family. The other uh, is doing what, doing what they love for work. So people that, um, actually it was more job and then doing what you love. So people that have a cause, like whether you're a plumber or whether you're a banker or see whatever it is, like having something to wake up to and go to and serve a purpose that gave people a lot of joy and then passion so a lot of times those are combined which is why i combine them but even mm. if it wasn't people are like i'm a plumber like but i make music there's one of my tiktok videos which is like not as watched but it's one of my favorites where this guy is literally throwing out trash this trash man he's throwing out trash and he's like look man ugh, if i'm working ugh, i'm happy and I didn't include it in the video, but he's like, yeah, man, I'm a DJ. And like, that's what made him happy. He was a DJ. He's like, I'm working here. And that's as long as I'm working, my kids is eating. And as long as my kids is eating, I'm happy. That's a direct quote from him. And then he's like, and I'm a DJ. So that kind of, he kind of encapsulates happiness, you know, across the world, family, work, and passion. That's what I've learned. And, you know, I'm kind of using that to, to try to be happy myself. I feel like I gotta ask it. So I've already seen somebody ask you if you're happy, but I didn't hear the why in the video, at least that I saw. Uh, you know, are you happy and what makes you happy? Man, that's a good question. And I, although I know it's always gonna come up, I, I really <laughs> never know what to say. Um, but yeah, man, I, I am happy. I know it's hard out there for some people. I know like the fact that I'm saying I am happy might offend some people, um, but I am because it's so easy to get bogged down and um, let down about everything that's happening in the world. But at the end of the day, it's what, what it's really about is your family. It, you know, what's for dinner tonight? Are the test results back? Is mom gonna be okay? Um, you know, uh, am I gonna hear my brother's voice again? And all those things, those things that actually matter to me personally, right now, do knock on wood, they're okay. They're not great, and but they're not bad either. And I'm in this like, just okay. And I'll take that. I will take just okay. Sometimes in life, you gotta put the good and the bad together and you're just okay. And that's, that's fine. I, I'll take that. I'm, I don't want any more, and please don't give me any less. So I'm happy. Um, 